In this video, we're going to show you 12 beautiful but tough perennials, which will look gorgeous no matter what your summer's going to throw at you. 10 of them are suitable for USDA zones five to nine. They're all suitable for the UK for many parts of Northern Europe, Canada, South Africa, and Australia, where I visited Antique Perennials, Australia's best loved and best known perennials nursery. Antique Perennials are a wholesale and retail nursery and they're in the Dandenong Mountains in Southern Australia. And if you looked at their average temperatures, just looking them up online, you'd think they were much the same as the average temperatures in summer and winter here in my garden in South East England. But I think that what all we temperate gardeners know is that we don't get average temperatures. We get extraordinary summers, we get non-average winters. Last year, the UK and several other parts of the world had an exceptionally hot summer with temperatures regularly in their 30s and hitting 40 Celsius, 104 Fahrenheit at one point with a long drought. Now that would be quite a normal average summer for antique perennials in the Dandenongs, except they were having a much cooler time and so much rain that at times the garden attached to their nursery was absolutely sitting in water. They had almost a year's worth of rain one month. So I've asked Mike to pick out 12 brilliant but tough perennials which will thrive in either these hot dry summers or the cooler wet ones and also to give us some tips for planting in perennial gardens. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog and I'll put links to antique perennials and any other resources I mention in the description below. So tell me how you set up this garden. Uh, we had a blank canvas. The first thing we did was to arrange our plants is we got our taller early grasses. We knew they would be really obvious start of the season, start of the early spring to mid spring. So they had to be in the right spot because there's gonna be, most of the perennials are gonna be very low that time of year. So having them nicely placed was the very, very first thing we did. And then there were other grasses we planted after that. So the mid grasses, and then we filled in with the perennials after that. So making sure we get the next part would have been the taller perennials. So trying to get the taller perennials not too close to some of the grasses, okay to meld some of them in, but getting the taller ones and then the rest can, can happen very easily, getting plenty of low stuff in certain areas. That was how we started the garden. Of course, it's changing all the time. Each year we come in and we'll rip a few things out, we'll add a few things, but that was the, that was the idea in the beginning. And would you say that any of the grasses in particular have been really quite resilient with, you know, overly hot days or overly hot summers and then terribly cool ones or wet ones or dry ones? Yeah, so the two that what I've already mentioned, the Stiper gigantia and Calmagrostis Carl Forster, then also Panicum, we've got a couple of Panicums, Panicum Blue Steel, they've done really well. So a lot of this garden was almost underwater for six months with the wet season we had, but they've also tolerated down here in Southeast Australia, very, very dry, hot yeah. summers as well, and they've coped really well. And in this little grouping here, what plants can you particularly recommend as being really resilient, going to take whatever the summer's going to hit um, them with? So particularly, there's, there's two here. So Persicaria affinis, this little low Persicaria here, tolerates sun to a little bit of shade. A little bit of shade will do really well, just won't flower quite as well, but tolerates it in both ways. Super cold, super wet, and then very dry. This is expo totally exposed here and does really well, really well. The other one, surprisingly, which can call it, we all know it can tolerate the sun, which is, and the heat, which is sedum, sedum autumn joy. There's two in particular, autumn joy, and then there's sedum matrona we've found. We all know they can tolerate the sun. We all know they can tolerate the dryness. Everyone knows, but they have been superb in super wet conditions and stuff that we thought they probably would have dropped off and rotted off, they've survived perfectly well. They've been really good plants. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. They're definitely on my shopping list for my garden in England. <laughs> right, so this area, tell me about it. Yeah, so there's two plants. They're really different, but they've both tolerated that, those extreme conditions. So. First one's Panicum Blue Steel, which is a Panicum that we bred. It's, it comes from Panicum, that's a, a seedling of Panicum Heavy Metal. Beautifully upright, blue-gray foliage, fantastic autumn colors in, in yellows, but it's tolerated both again for us. So really good in, in the hot sun and those longer summers, surprisingly well. And then also, if it's here looking this good now with the summer we've had, it's fantastic. The other one, I know it's just the stackies, but a stackies big ears, far better than the normal stackies that you've always seen. Big ears is just a fantastic plant. It doesn't rot out in the centre, stays dense all through, fantastic plant. Can tolerate a little bit of shade as well, which is odd for a, for a lamb's ears, but really good plant for that position. 
Right, so tell us about the plants in this corner. Sure, again some plants that are renowned to be do very well in hot dry, which is the Achillea, Achillea moonshine, which is cultivar of the Clip Clipiolata uh, ones. So they're the silver leaf, central growing ones, not the running crazy ones that do run a bit. Being the central crowning ones, they tend to flower really well every year. They don't peter out, they don't get too congested. And that, that again has tolerated very wet conditions, especially my home garden as well, it's done really well. The other one is Salvia relative. So it's Lepicinia salviae, so it's a so, salvia looking plant but not quite a salvia really beautiful foliage and by the end of the season like this on a hot summer still got lovely clean foliage it hasn't burned off or anything there's no spots on it there's nothing like that it's a beautiful plant and tolerates both things it's really hardy and both cold and wet and super dry i think you've got a great favorite of mine here so is it is it aster aster twilight it is oh. so this is the first day of autumn here and it still looks beautifully and clean full flower great late summer, early autumn flower, but again, so tough in both conditions. We've had that in both in my garden for a long, long time, and it tolerates beautifully in both conditions. But again, like some of the other plants I've talked about, lovely clean foliage at the end of summer, which is hard to do in hot summers. So you wanna have that lovely clean foliage that doesn't upset the flowering. I mean, there's plenty of plants that can get away with it with a bit of dirty foliage at the end because their flowers are so good. But if you can get the bonus of both, it's fantastic. And that's one of them. Are the asters generally quite resilient? Uh, so, some of them just a bit more than others. So the larger leaf ones like this, much easier. Again, Aster tatarichus, very tall up here copes really well as well. Some of the other ones can just drink a little bit more, whereas we found this one doesn't drink at all. It's really good. So, Crocosmia. Yes, yeah, so lovely dark green foliage on this Crocosmia. Um, it's one that we imported from Seattle um, about seven or eight years ago from Far Reaches Nursery. Fantastic nursery if you're ever in Seattle. Yeah, really lovely. Again, nice late, late colour, which is nice to have. Not everything has to be early. So really fantastic in in those hotter conditions as well really good yeah we found that's crocosmia miss scarlet really lovely red beautiful do the other crocosmias like lucifer for example do they withstand a pretty good variation in temperature and wane yeah so they're not so they're, they're quite good as well the ones that i've found that are a little less some of the lighter colors some of the smaller lighter colors with a bit more lime foliage on them just tend to get a bit burnt out by those hot summers for some reason the lighter foliage whereas the darker green foliage seems to be doing really well and this is another really good plant for variable conditions. Yeah, it sure is. It's not like some of the other ones I've talked about that flower late. This is a very early flower. So it flowers for us in November. So that's mid spring. But I think as it ages and, it, and these get darker and darker, the flower heads looks even better. Again, can tolerate a little bit of shade. Doesn't flower quite as well, but is super in hot, hot conditions. Once it's established, it does take a little bit of work getting it in, but once it's in, it's fantastic. Yeah, I really like it, especially as you can leave those flower heads on and you get that lovely dark flower head, uh, which is really lovely in the late, late autumn. So you're saying that the larger persicarias actually are sometimes not a great choice because their leaves get a bit burned by the end of summer. Yeah, so unlike the smaller persicaria, which we talked about earlier, persicaria affinis, the larger ones, um, they just drink a little bit more. So those harder summers, they will drink a little bit more. They're, you can chop them come start of spring, which I do. If I know I'm in for a hard summer, when the plants say, just above knee height, I'll take it down almost to the ground. I'll lose a lot of flowers, but it gets through that hot period, that second two months of summer, a little bit easier, but it's a bit of a garden maintenance thing. So you do have to do something. You will be watering a little bit more. So you've got a bulb here that you've got in this category of really good in any kind of summer that's going to hit you. Yeah, and it's not one that's not, it's probably well known. Uh, Allium Millennium, beautiful plant. Uh, once established, you can have 100 flowers on one clump, super dry and does in, in this garden here was almost almost submerged in water for going four months so it's tolerated both ends beautifully also just a fantastic cut flower once established you can have loads of flowers on them so yeah really lovely plant for us down here we want to have a few plants that are always going to win they're always going to grow well for you so don't forget your grasses. Don't just please, they, they make your perennial garden so good. We've got in certain parts of the garden here that'd be up to 40% of grasses in areas. That's probably a bit too much, but then it does peter out in areas. So we've got thick with grasses. And as I said earlier, they were the plants we planted first, the taller grasses, but getting some of the smaller 
grasses that you can spot through your perennial gardens, really important. Don't so much worry about colour, that can be totally up to you. So trying to miss out on certain colours, you might miss a certain period in your garden that might look really good and uh, if you've just cancelled out yellow, like there's so many yellow flowers that you're going to miss out on. So yeah, in nature you never see in the greatest wild meadow photo that you gush over, there's just about every colour in the rainbow. So don't worry, don't, can, don't get so bogged down in colours, go for more foliage and more different shapes in your gardens. That's the main thing. You've used a grass as a hedge here. Hmm. So can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so we use Calamagrostis Carl Forster as a hedge. It just came across us one day when we were first planning out. We knew we needed a break into the paddock because it is just paddock behind us. And then we've got the lovely national park behind us. So a hard hedge, a clipped hedge might be just a bit too rigid for us here with the national park. We want to borrow that landscape. We don't want to block it. It's beautiful, our native bush. So the Calamagrostis is early flowering. So we get that height really quickly. And the straw colored heads this time of year does tie in with the paddocks behind. And it's not completely blocking you out. You get to see through. So you're not, it's not totally ignoring everything that's out there. It's really worked well for us. So the, it's perfect hedge height, stops where it does it. We don't have to come across every four weeks and take the top off it. We don't have to take the sides off it every four weeks. So maintenance wise, it works really well. It's a beautiful upright, upright grass. So it doesn't flop out and then take up the path. And all we do is the very start of spring, we just cut it to about 30 centimetres, 20 centimetres, and it's back in no time, luscious and green. And then the flowers are really quick that season. So it's not, if it was a late flowering grass, it wouldn't work. We need to have that cover really early, but yeah, love it or hate it, we love it. Um, for a grass hedge, there's, I haven't seen it done many times, but yeah, we really enjoy it, it's good. And if you'd like more brilliant, but resilient perennials, don't miss our beautiful borders playlist at the end of this video. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.